Tonight, what I want to do is I just want to kind of open by reminding you uh, that we are a global church. Now, you may not know what that word means, global. It means we are both global and local. You know, there's a, a, a scripture out of Acts where uh, Jesus says that his spirit would fall upon the disciples and they would be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the ends of the earth. And I want to tell you this, that your church is a witness to the gospel, not just in Long Beach, not just in California, not just in the United States. States of America, but to the very ends of the earth. And what we saw on this trip to the Philippines was we saw the very hand of God move us in and out of this country. If you know anything about our trip and we're following along, you saw that 50,000 flights got delayed or canceled within 24 hours. Microsoft was hacked and many people left stranded millions around the world unable to fly. God did an absolute miracle through a man named George that worked for Filipino Airlines when he found us six tickets on one flight going into Taipei, Taiwan. I think uh, Isai sat in the bathroom the whole flight, but we made it. Amen. We fly into the Philippines. It's a miracle. We get there. And then eight hours behind us, uh, Typhoon Gemni comes in to the Philippines and brings literally 15 inches of water upon the city of Manila in one day. The city was flooded. Plains were flooded. But we were ahead of the storm every step of the way. Torrential rain, roads shut down. But God made a way for us to minister the truth of his gospel. I remember one morning where we were sitting by a pool, a pool that had been dug by our pastor and one of the associate pastors, looking at it thinking, wow, it's raining a lot. This pool is going to overflow. Uh, five inches of rain in just a few hours in the region that we were in. And we were sitting there thinking, God, there is no way that we're going to get from Calabunga to Alabat, this island that we need to go to. And we just begin to pray and ask God, God, we need it to stop raining. Lord, we love rain and we know that you come as water as the Holy Spirit. But God, we need some fire to dry this up. Amen. And it stopped raining that very morning. We traveled all the way to Alaba, the clearest, cleanest, easiest water I've ever seen. All the way there, all the way back. Literally, people saying this is a miracle from God. The day we got into Manila was the day that the flood had subsided. Everything was open and we flew back home, though there was lightning all over the place. I'm telling you that God made a way. I, I tell you that to tell you this, that when God wants something done, he will get it done. And when God wants people to go somewhere, he will send those people there. Each one of these people that went on this trip, it was not me saying, hey, I want to spend time with this person. It was me saying this, God, who do you want to send on this trip? Each one of them, their faces came up to me in prayer. And I prayed and I asked, I even asked Isai as a brand new newlywed, please, God, let Ole not hate me for the rest of my life. And God stirred her heart where it was immediately, maybe a no, God opened up a door and said, you know what? Through his wife, if you need to be there and God wants you there, then go and do the work that God has called you to. Seeing what Omari went through, seeing what Ian went through, seeing what Mike went through. I, I can't wait for you guys to hear more about what God did in Pastor Alberto while we were there. But I'll say this, that God wanted these men to go on this trip for this specific reason so that we could see healing, so that lives could be restored, so that people could give their life to Jesus. And listen to me, you were a part of this team. If you prayed for us, if you fasted with us, many of you messaged me and said, Pastor Sean, I'm fasting with you. We just want to say thank you because you went with us on this trip. Amen. Our ministry partner in the Philippines is called Jesus, our banner, and we believe that he covers us. We believe that he is our banner, and we've seen that on this trip. So here's what I want to do tonight. I want to take some time for you to hear about the miraculous and amazing things that God did in the lives of these men, these ministers, these people of God that were sent on this trip, and for you to get a little sneak peek into some of the behind the scenes moments, uh, moments like where we dropped down to 100 feet and then had to take off again in an airplane. I'll tell you, there were moments of fear, but also moments of great trust in God. Would you welcome the team as they come to share with you tonight?
Well, amen. And church, we're so grateful for each of you. Thank you for taking time to hear what God was doing on this trip. I, I want to remind you that we've been in partnership now uh, for almost 20 years with an incredible organization, Jesus Our Banner Ministries. We've now seen over 30 churches planted recently, 40 plus all together in the work that we've done. And we've seen Pastor Ralph and Joji steward the work in the Philippines to where many pastors and leaders have been raised up, not just in our churches and in our region, but to uh, bolster, to upgird, to, to really strengthen the church in all of Asia, not just in the Philippines. One of our best young leaders is now in Japan teaching English, and she got the opportunity on her break to come and be with us in the Philippines. And we're so grateful for this ministry partnership. I first went on mission uh, to the Philippines in 2012. And uh, that next trip, that second trip, Pastor Alberto went with me, isai has been with me. And these brothers really coming for the first time on this trip and getting to experience the goodness of God. And so I wanted to take some time to ask them questions that might stir some of your questions and might cause you to hear a little bit more about God's goodness. So the first question that I wanna ask is this, what was a moment that you will always remember from this mission trip? I wanna start with Omari. Omari, if you would maybe share with us, what is a moment that you will always remember from this mission trip? Um, well, for sure, the flight, you already mentioned that. That was uh, really scary. Um, you know, like you said, we went down and went back up three, four different times, and I was just really holding it together to not throw up. But that was, um, that was really memorable, but I'd say the thing that was the most memorable was just kind of sitting back and worshiping God and just looking at the crowd of um, kids at the youth event we did for the first three days and just seeing how, you know, they were just so into the worship and so, you know, there was just such a big change in them from day one to the final day. And, you know, just like seeing them on day one and like, wow, these kids are really excited. But then getting to know their stories and hearing how, you know, one of them, their um, family didn't want them to be a Christian. They came from like six, eight hours away. And, you know, that was just really um, inspirational, you know, it made me really think about how good we have it in places where I know in the Philippines, some places they can't really worship God openly. Or I, I heard that. And, um, you know, it just made me really appreciate how, you know, growing up in a Christian family and having that support in that area, they pulled me away from, you know, doing bad things from, and, you know, to just, it really made me appreciate it more how I grew up. Come on, Omari, I love that. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Alberto, but before we do, I think, Ian, the way you said it about that flight was when the stewardesses scream, you know something's wrong, Right. Um, we heard a little yelp and some screaming, and we knew that it was not going to be a good flight, right? Uh, Pastor Alberto, what's, what's something that uh, you're taking away from this trip that you'll always remember, even as you've been there already? Yeah, um, I think probably for me, the, the moment I'm going to remember the most is actually a, just a, a really, really great conversation we had. I, I can't remember if it was the last night of the revival night or actually on the boat back from this remote island that we went to to go back to other churches that we were starting to uh, form in this trip. But there was a, a young leader there uh, named Zeke. And I remember just having a really, really intimate conversation. I, we were uh, talking about our testimonies. We were talking about how different they are, how my story is I didn't know Jesus for a long time. I encountered him, and I radically transformed, right? God transformed my life. But for him, it was very different. And it was just so amazing to hear not just him, but just so many of the youth. And, and he sticks out to me because I, he was sharing his story with me and he was sharing about how he grew up in the church, right? He was there every single day. His dad is a pastor, all these different things. And how it was, I'm still blown away. And I, I still am always like, no, we, we learn from you guys. We're not, sometimes I don't feel like we, we you know, give as much, as much as we receive from them. But he said that the faith that we had to come here to be on, on mission, to partner with the people in the Philippines, to share the love of God with them, has slowly inspired him and changed his heart sure. to not just be familiar with Jesus, to not just be coming to church, to not just be doing what his dad wants him to do, but his heart really started to come alive to Jesus. He started to experience a personal spiritual awakening and revival, and I got to just see tears running down his face as he came to receive prayer, and, and you know, I asked him, what do you want prayer for? And he literally told me, like, I'm, 
I'm, I'm, I'm amazed because Jesus is finally coming to life for me. And I'm thankful to you guys because you have helped me see over and over and over again how real he is for you. And I've seen now that he can be real for me. Wow. And to just think to myself like, wow, like, man, we sometimes are just, you know, if we just sacrifice, if we just give, if we give generously, if we have this vision to just share the love of God with other people, it, God really does move. Even someone that's heard the gospel over and over and over again, it can come alive for them. Yeah. Um, wow. Thank you for that. I think that's so good. We had an opportunity, Mike and Ian and I, uh, to worship on Sunday in the church where Zeke leads worship, uh, or as I like to call him, Isai Filipino version. Uh, impeccable hair, great style. You know, it was, it was definitely some discipleship happening there for sure. Um, but, you know, Naga, the area that that church is in, Naga is named after a great serpent. And uh, Zeke had said during worship, uh, I want these people not to worship a great serpent, but to worship the one who has crushed the serpent. I want them to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I saw such power and authority come from such a young man. Uh, it was amazing because when we left on Sunday, the power went out at the church. Anybody remember that? Um, and preached without any power. And we had to get some new lights and some crazy things happened while we were gone. But uh, right when we were starting that service, the power went out as well. Uh, the water had knocked out part of the power in the city and the water went out. And Zeke just kept getting louder and louder and louder in praise. And I remember, uh, Isai, you had, a, you had a spiritual warfare shirt on that Sunday. And I hope that you burn that thing and you never wear it in our church ever again. But uh, I, I remember uh, when, when that happened saying, we don't need instruments to worship our God and, and when that happened, Zeke said the same thing. We don't need instruments to worship our God. We don't need power. We just need our voices. Praise him, glorify him. And so we saw a similar spirit that God was moving here in this way and moving there in a similar way. So we felt your prayers. We've, we are so grateful for the way that you are uh, serving to train up leaders in the Philippines. Uh, Mike, I wanna ask you, I, I know uh, you grew up in Asia. You grew up in Indonesia. Um, so we were close to where you're from, and you're maybe a little more used to the weather than we are. Uh, you know, weather where uh, you take a shower and you already need a shower as soon as you take a shower. Um, Mike, what, what was something that you experienced on this trip that you are taking away with you uh, forever coming out of the Philippines trip? When I see them worship, and I share with Isai and many others too, um, they worship and pray sincere even with all the limitation they have i remember here larry would say eh, some of them were not they're here and they're not here anymore hey that was my chair they would walk away <laughs> wow right there they have to travel by tricycle some of them but the pedaling one uh brother omar you mentioned it some of them have to travel far away for hours uh and I would ask myself, and if somebody take my car away, would I still go to church? Right? That's good. If, if somebody take my Nikes, would I still go to church? Because they go to church with sandals, right? By walk and uh, humid <laughs> with power or no power. Mm. That's what I, I, and I came from that kind of church. So I, I know, right? So when I saw that, I was like, agree again with Omar. We're blessed. At the same time, I don't want to forget. You know what I mean? Uh, wow. Even the people that went to Mexico, I went there, I think, two years ago. Same thing. And a lot of you guys uh, give your shoes away because of the work they do. So mm -hmm. that's the stuff that I remember. That's awesome. Wow. Thank you, Mike, for that. We now affectionately call Mike Tito Mike. Uh, he is Uncle Mike. He takes care of the missions team, makes sure that we eat. Uh, I think he gave everybody an extra helping of rice, even when they didn't want it. Um, and uh, we're so grateful, man, that you kept us uh, fed, sleeping, doing what we were supposed to do. We appreciate you. The, the second yeah, vitamins, that's true. The second question I want to ask is, and, and maybe I'll pass it to Isai. I want to hear from you a little bit, Pastor. What was something unexpected that happened on this trip? 
We talked about moments that will take away forever, but what was something unexpected that you didn't know that God was going to do on this trip? I got, um, I got invited to, to preach at a sister church called, uh, in an area called Ratai, which is not that far away from where we were staying. It was literally like, if we wanted to, we could have walked there five minutes. Um, but they were gracious enough to pick us up and drive us there. And um, I remember that, that Sunday morning at 4 a.m., I felt like God woke me up. And so I, I stepped out of my room to, to sit outside um, and to just pray. And I was so tired. I was, I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, God, I'm here, but I'm going back to bed. And so I went back to bed, and I had this dream of the church sunken. So the, the church was like in a, in a slope, and it was sinking. And I remember just thinking, God, what are you trying to tell me? Like, um, I had already prepared a message, so I was like, God, are you trying to t- tell me something different, something about the firm foundation? And I walk inside, and I see the pastor of the church, and she goes, oh, don't worry. It, we're still going to worship. We're still going to bring people in, but we just need your prayers right now. So I thought that was very odd. And we go, um, it was in an afternoon, so it was like 2 p.m. on Sunday. And we sit in service, and after the worship, they start doing testimonies. And the roof opens, and all this water just falls inside the building. And I had to follow up that. (laughs) So I I had to preach after that. And they asked me, to do a benediction. And I said, we're going to pray for this building. And so I invited everybody in the room to just start praying over the building. They put their hands over the building. They started blessing the building. We just prayed that God would protect that building. And I think it was unexpected for me because I don't feel like God necessarily speaks to me in vision like that all the time. But it was such a powerful moment of God reminding me that he loves me and he wants to be with me. And that in being with me, he's going to use me to do mighty things outside of that. Um, another moment that I want to share uh, rapidly is about six years ago, I started coming to Light in Life. And um, every Sunday, I fell in love with communion every Sunday. That wasn't something that we would do. And so I would come to the altar. Like uh, I pre- I'm pretty sure Pastor Frazier said that there was an area over there of his tears. I'm pretty sure I'm right next to it, just <laughs> over there. And Pastor Joji, when she was living here, she would come and pray over me every second or third service. And I had this powerful moment. She was actually in Pastor Sean's line for prayer, and she switched to my line. And I was able to spend a moment, a full, a full circle moment, where she had prayed blessings and, and, and favor over me. And now I had the privilege as a pastor here at Light and Life to pray blessings over her and that was one of the most powerful full circle moments for me. I will never forget. That felt unexpected to me because she's like, she's like Pastor Deb of the Philippines. Like, imagine if Pastor Deb came to ask me for prayer. And it felt so honoring and so powerful that I got that opportunity. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Isai. It really felt on this trip like there was a lot of prophetic happening a lot of visions, a lot of dreams, a lot of things that God showed us. And that really was incredible that you saw this church sinking and then the roof just breaks open in the middle of the service and you didn't stop the service. You didn't stop worshiping. You just kept going and praying. And, and, I, and I wonder, like, um, you know, what would happen if, if our roof just broke open? Would people just keep praising and worshiping God? And that was just a powerful moment, Isai. I'm so grateful that you were there and that you got to lead in that trip as an example and a reminder of that. I'm going to pass it to Ian. Ian, what's, a, what's something that happened on this trip that was unexpected for you? Yeah, so when we had gotten to the island, there was a lot going on on that island. A lot of uh, evil on that island. A lot of cults. A lot of things not of God, a lot of Islam. And a result of that was that one of the women who had come with her kids to seek prayer and seek time to get close to the Lord, it's a woman who had five kids, and two of them were special needs. Mm -hmm. And her husband had disowned her and all of her kids because she came to know Jesus Christ as her Lord. 
and he was still stuck in Islam. And we prayed over her before and after service. And what really hit me was that each of her five kids came up individually and asked for prayer for their father. Not only for the reconciliation of their family, but that their father would know the truth, that he would know Jesus. Wow. These are six, seven, eight-year-old, I think the oldest was around 12. 12, yeah. And they're coming to prayer Mm -hmm. so that their father would leave a life of death and return to the life that Jesus had for him. That's faithfulness. Yeah, that hit me. Wow, such a deep moment and a reminder of having faith like a child. I mean, we saw that over and over again, young children praying with faith that God would heal their families, restore their families. Um, So grateful for that. I think one thing that was unexpected for me is I expected Isai to have dreams and visions or Pastor Alberto or Omari, um, but I didn't think that I would. And I know we got into an area and I shared a little bit of this story, but I got to see somebody that got healed from a trip that we did three years ago. And uh, this man had not walked um, and he had prostate cancer and was dying in a wheelchair. And when we met him, when I say wheelchair, I'm not talking about a wheelchair like in the U.S. I'm talking about a plastic chair with bamboo wheels on it that had been kind of knit together and made uh, usable. And um, brother's name is Rolando, and we got we to gotta pray with him, and he got up out of that wheelchair. Um, and we didn't know. Sometimes you go and you do missionary work, and you see miracles, and you want to hear stories afterwards. You want to know what God did after you were there. And uh, we, we get to this little house, and, and we're in this area outside of um, Manila, and, and we're talking to leaders in the area, believing for a church to be planted in the community. And uh, we walk up, and there he is. And I'm like, I recognize this guy from somewhere. And he starts sharing his testimony. And one of the pastors leans over, and he's like, that's that man that you prayed for that got up out of that wheelchair. And he shared about how he didn't have prostate cancer anymore, but even greater than that, Jesus had healed his soul. And he encouraged the leaders of his village to give their life to Jesus. And uh, it was just incredible to see. And then after we preached and we prayed, Uh, There was a young group of young girls that were worshipers but weren't really using their gift and uh, people that were struggling with disease. And one lady in particular that had a really rare cancer and she was slowly dying and he just began to pray for her by faith. And we saw God move and these young women said, we want to worship God again. We want to get back into the church. We want to serve God with our gift. And then I get a call as I come back getting ready for Sunday morning at like five o'clock in the morning from one of the leaders there. Lonnie and Lonnie tells me pastor I just got to tell you that woman that you guys prayed for she is cancer free in the name of Jesus and it just rocked me coming into that we serve a God that still heals we serve a God that is the same yesterday today and forever and and I and I wonder sometimes if we focus too much on the physical healing But the fact that that woman gave her life to Jesus and then he healed her body so that she could go and share the truth of what he's done and how many people will be reached. During that outreach, uh, I caught a vision and I saw a basketball court with pillars around it. I saw a green gate and a blue floor and I saw cement steps and it was very vivid. I saw it like it was you sitting in front of me. And I asked Lonnie, I leaned over to her. I said, is there a basketball court around here? And her eyes got kind of wide and she said, what did it look like? I said, well, it had pillars and there was seating on the side and I saw a green gate and a blue floor and she just began to weep, tears coming down her eyes. She said, that court is right around the corner from here. And I said, I saw that court full of people giving their lives to Jesus. We have to go to that court. And so uh, before we went uh, home afterwards, uh, we stopped at the court and uh, there was God already moving ahead of us. The police officers there, one was a believer. The guy that was leading the overseeing of that court, a believer. And the court was dark. We couldn't see it. I mean, you could have walked by it and not noticed it. And he said, hold on, hold on. I want to turn the lights on. And, you know, running to the back and turning breakers on for us. He turns the breakers on and here's this bright green gate and a blue floor. 
And I just began to praise God saying, God, I believe by faith that this court is going to be filled with people that give their lives to Jesus. And that guy that manages that court says, I've been praying that very prayer that God would do that here. And we're going to put that on the calendar. And I promise you that when you come back next year, you're going to have heard about the revival that hit this city and how God moved in this city. And so I just want to encourage you. Maybe you can't see what God is doing or God gives you a little glimpse of it. Let it be that unexpected thing that he leads you into. You never know what's waiting on the other side of it. A family healed, a father restored, uh, literally a storm coming your way, uh, a vision of the future and what God might do. Just follow him and believe that he is with you every step of the way. Amen, church? Amen. The next question I want to ask is, uh, what's something that you learned from God on this trip? What's something that you learned from God on this trip? Mike, I'll just start with you. What's something that you felt like God taught you while we were on this trip? When seeing the local people worship, I see they're sincere because you know we, we've been in a men uh, Bible study together. I said in the past, we almost don't need faith here in the U.S. Even though we have our own struggle. When I say we almost don't need faith, meaning, well, I'm hungry. Well, I guess I use my Amex. Go to McDonald's. Yeah. They don't have that. We ate a bunch of fried chicken there for eight <laughs> days. <laughs> and punk it. But that's all they have. Yeah. Right? We're here. If one of my sons sick, take him to Kaiser. So what kind of faith we need? Right? That's what I learned. Where mm. they don't have, and for that reason, they believe. We're here, we got everything. AC good, good clothes given to me, you know what I mean? Uh, they don't have good clothes, good shoes, they don't have good coffee. It was absolutely terrible. Oh my goodness. But hey, the people still happy, cheerful, uh, such a simple life. That's right, Mike. You know what I mean? But here, we got everything. That's what I learned. Wow. Yeah, I think what I saw over and over again, we talked a lot about this at two, three o'clock in the morning sometimes is just that faith to trust like God is healer because I need him to heal and I have no access to medicine. I mean, we went and got cough drops for kids that we saw coughing. We, we saw a woman literally while we were worshiping coming in off the street with her four month old child and then sleep on a mattress outside of our hotel. And we just couldn't walk by that. I mean, how do you walk by something like that? But these people coming in by faith, believing that God is healer. And we saw miraculous things happen. I wonder what it would look like, Mike, if we lean less on what we had and more on the God that has us. Amen. That was such a good word and a reminder for us. Um, Omari, what, what's something that you felt like you learned from God on this trip? Um, mine is actually pretty similar to Mike's in the sense of just getting a better perspective on your own life. Um, God was speaking to me a lot during this trip about um, compartmentalizing, like just serving through strife because, um, you know, there's a lot going on with me and my family right now. And, you know, it's just a really tough season. And so like, this was my first mission trip and I jumped right into like a 12 day thing. And so like, I was good the first seven days, the first six days. And then by like day eight, I'm just like, God, I just want to go home. I just want to go home so bad, Father. And he was just, you know, hitting me with all kinds of Bible verses, like, cast your cares at my feet, you know. Um, just, like, really just keeps hitting me with things like that. And, you know, like, just reminding me, like, yeah, life's not always going to be, you know, like, you can't always have full peace because, you know, I mean, most of us won't have full peace knowing, you know, if we got something going on at home, like, you know, that you can't, you can't do anything about it. There's nothing you could do, and there's people that need help right in front of you. So, you know, you just kind of, you know, God was toughening me up a little bit in the spirit just by seeing, like, yeah, what's going on at home? You know, it kind of sucks. But then, um, you know, at least you have, like Mike was saying, like, you got a home. Like, you got all these different blessings from just living in America. And so it was a lot of different times where it was like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm so sad, God. I just want to go home. And it's like, get with it, you know. But um, it reminds me of one of my favorite things that I learned from my mentor, um, his name is Charles. He's a prophet and a rapper. 
And so um, one of his lines was worship even when I'm hurting. And so that just was in my head the whole time. It's like, okay, you know, get with it. That's good. That's so good. <laughs> Ian, what's something you feel like you learned uh, on this trip from God? Yeah, I feel like about four days in, uh, we're driving out, and it was early morning. We got like three hours of sleep, and God was reminding me of my required re- reliance upon him, and he had specifically targeted a part of me that I often trust God for my second wind. That was like, okay, God, I got this on my own means, my own strength, and when I get low, then let me turn to you and be like, God, give me the strength to keep going. God was telling me, no, Ian, that's wrong. I want to walk with you. I want to give you strengths and energy from the beginning. You will go so much farther, be able to do so much more if you trust me as your source of strength, your source of energy from the beginning. We were running around a lot, traveling a lot, preaching a lot, right? I couldn't even sit down restfully. Those chairs are really small, and I am really big. They, they have a name for me out there. They call me Kuya Goliath <laughs> because I'm not built for the chairs that they have, so I can't even sit restfully. But the Lord sustained my strengths throughout every day, throughout every trial, throughout every hardship that came from that. Sometimes the air quality was really good. Sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes we got decent sleep. Sometimes we didn't. The Lord was reminding me that I don't turn to him when I get low. I turn to him. Yeah. That it isn't a last resort, but it is my first resort. So good, Ian. Yeah, such a good reminder. Such a good reminder. I want to ask uh, Pastor Alberto, Pastor Isai, um, what... And this could lead into our last question, but you know what? What's something you learned from the Filipino people while you were there? I think um, what's dangerous about missions work is we could think that we're bringing them God, um, and we forget that God is everywhere at all times. Um, we didn't bring anybody Jesus. Jesus was already there. We just came to remind them that He is with them and He is for them and He is not against them. Um, we, we came because we've been set free and we wanted to see those people set free. What, what's something that you learned from those Filipino people and then maybe even couple that with, what are you bringing back to our church from this time in the Philippines? Some dust from our shoes. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I remember a conversation I had with Pastor Guy um, who graciously allowed us to stay in his house for the first week. And um, in my conversations with him, I always have, I always feel like I have really good conversations with him. He's, he plays around a lot. And so it's really hard to like focus him in. And so those moments of, of five minutes of clarity with him are just so powerful. Um, Cause he says some of the deepest things. And, and one day I asked him like, Pastor Guy, why, why is it that we worry so much? Like I, I, I just didn't understand it. You know, this man literally does not worry a soul. You know, he's never worried. And he told me, because I know that in some way, shape, or form, God will take care of me. If I don't have food, I know my, my neighbor has food, and I can ask him for food. And if he doesn't have food, then we're okay suffering together. And if tomorrow we have food, we have food tomorrow. And it's just, it's one of those things that, you know, and, and, and Mike touched up on it, knowing how deep their faith is, that they, that they trust in God and in each other really, really well, um, really speaks to me every single time. And just the way that they worship is an expression of that faith. They worship like they know that tomorrow God can come at any moment. And I sometimes pray that we would worship the same way. And so it was very impactful to me seeing that 1030 service with the lights out and everybody sitting in service, you know, listening to the word and receiving from God because that showed me as well where our church is. Yeah. That we're not, we're, not, we're not worried about, well, we didn't have lights, we didn't have sound, we didn't have all the fancy things, so we're going to go home. We stayed for Jesus. And, and that is something that I want to thank all of you 
Thank you for coming to seek Jesus as much as we come to seek Jesus. Amen. That's good. Um, I was going to share something different, but I feel like God told me to say something different right now. When I was listening to Pastor Isai, I think tied into with Pastor Guy, and I feel like it's a quality that I've learned in my uh, many trips to the Philippines, is that so many Filipinos have a very similar mindset, not quite like Guy, but very similar, this idea that like when they put their faith in God, they don't see like they're not allowed to worry. And, I, and just to add on what Pastor, Pastor Isai was saying, I, I feel like I've learned from the Filipino people that their, their highest blessing to them, their reward, their treasure, isn't stuff that they're seeking from God. It's God himself. Mm. And I feel like we miss that all the time. And I feel like every time I go, God has to check me and remind me and ask me that question, like, am I your highest blessing? Am I greater than life to you? Am, am, are you the, am I the thing that you love the most? Or are you still worried about things that are back home? Are you still um, not sure what I'm going to do in your life? And you're, you're, you're fretting and you're anxious. You're not sure how this is going to work out or that's going to work out. And I'm reminded that they're so much more joyful because they're just living out of their identity as children of God. Like that's, that's their life. And out of that, they have this joy that we're always left like, where, where does it come from? Like, how are they getting that? And we have to be reminded, wow, there's nothing else in their life to them. Even if they get things, right? If they receive blessings, they don't forget where it comes from. God is literally their highest blessing. And that's something that I, I hope to take with me here and to remind myself always, like, even though we come from a place that is full of blessings, even though we come from a place that we have everything that we could need or ask for, no, this, you know, no place is perfect, but we are blessed here. But I'm trying to remind myself, don't, don't forget that we live for more than just problems and worries and things to figure out. We live as God's children, and we should be walking around with that kind of victory and that kind of joy. Wow, that's so good. Such a great reminder. I love how the Spirit of God kind of puts everybody on the same page. I was going to end by saying, I, I think what, what I'm bringing back to our church, and this might sound simplistic, um, but it really is an attitude of gratitude. They're always finding something to be thankful for. The snacks are terrible. The fried chicken is so greasy. The rain was just absolutely tough. It was always humid and sweaty and there's smog everywhere. I mean, you guys, there was so many things to find to complain about. I don't think I heard one pastor or one leader complain one time. But just being so grateful for the moment that God had them in. What I found was I found a, a church and a people that really believe that the greatest blessing is the presence of God. And, and we preached on that at this church, but I wonder what our church will look like as we bring what the Spirit of God is doing there back here as a reminder that we're not just planting churches there. We're not just saving souls, but they are saving us from our consumerism. They are saving us from our preoccupation. They are saving us from our love and infatuation for media and reminding us that God loves us that he's with us and he's for us and he's not against us. And he speaks to us in the sunrise at 4 a.m. He speaks to us when cotton fruit falls out of the tree onto the tin roof and wakes us up because we think it's gunshots. He speaks in the midst of dogs barking as soon as the sun comes up. If you go to the Philippines, you'll learn chickens don't start crowing when the sun comes up. They do it until the sun comes up. Literally, I mean, there were so many things that we could have been frustrated or upset about, but every moment they saw as an opportunity to be thankful for the presence of God. You don't know how many times, right, Mike, in the middle, they just said, we are so grateful to be with you guys. I wonder if we just need to learn to be more grateful to be with each other. Can I just stop for a second and say, God, I want to repent for the times that I've not been grateful to be with my friends, be with the church, the fact that we have this building. Sometimes we are so ungrateful for the very things we pray for, our kids, our spouse, our job, our friendships. We find things to grumble and be frustrated about 
What I'm taking back with me, I think what we're, if I could say that, I don't want to speak for the team, but we're taking back is an attitude of gratitude because the greatest blessing, it's not instruments, it's not a building, it's not AC, it's not lighting, it is the presence of God. It is a God that loves us and has chosen us, that is for us and not against us. What I'm excited about is over the next couple of weeks, you're gonna hear about the work that we're doing. We've entitled this series, Therefore Go. Uh, you, you receive this verse from Acts where he says, therefore go and make disciples. And we remember in Matthew that this is the calling of the church. And we want you to remember that the church is not just Long Beach, but the church is the world. You're gonna hear a little bit about what we've been doing in partnership with Indonesia. I love that Mike got to be a part of this team. Mike, Mark, Mike literally, he, he, brother, you won't, ever, you won't ever say this, but this brother literally helped build the foundation of that church with his hands. Would walk and gather rocks and plant that church. And, and we planted an orphanage for, for literally kids that have no one. Their parents have abandoned them in the middle of a jungle. We own a city in partnership called City of Praise. Literally, the city is City of Praise where that church is. And Mike, I'm so grateful that God brought you from there to this church and sent you to the Philippines. You're gonna hear more about that work next week. And then you're gonna hear about the work that we've been doing in Latin America. I just wanna say, I am so grateful for Stephanie and our Mexico missions team that just got back from Mexico. They have been doing an absolutely incredible mission work there, reaching kids, serving kids. And that's not it, it's not just Mexico, it's also in the DR where you guys have sponsored over 100 kids um, one of my sons, as a part of my house that lives in the Dominican Republic, David, he just turned nine years old. And we have a community center slash church, a two-story building that you guys funded, that you built, where over 100 kids that we sponsor, many of them Haitian refugees, are hearing about the goodness of God. You're going to get to hear about what God is doing in Guatemala and El Salvador. You're going to get to hear about how you are a part of a global church. And we're so grateful for this opportunity that we got to open up with this incredible partnership. I'll say this, this is really where this all started at Light and Life. We've been to Ethiopia, we've been to Thailand, we've been to Cuba, we've been to many other places. We've had opportunities to partner in our own backyard to the very ends of the earth. But what I want you to do is not just pray for us, pray for pastors Ralph and Joji and the apostolic work that they're doing there. We're believing in partnership that God is gonna plant 100 churches before they go to be with Jesus. And we want you to be praying for them. Pray for Ralph and Joji Silo. Pray for Pastor Guy and pray for our pastors that are our brothers and sisters in the Philippines. You'll be hearing more updates about what God is doing. But remember, you are part of a global family. This is not just an American church. It is the church of the world that Jesus is rescuing. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm so grateful that you guys got to share. Can we thank the team for sharing tonight? What a powerful testimony of God's goodness. And a reminder that God doesn't just use pastors, but he uses the church for his glory, for his honor, and for his praise. Would you stretch out your hands towards these individuals? We want to bless them tonight. And I pray that you would spend the rest of your night uh, getting to know their story a little bit more and hearing more of what God is doing in partnership with Jesus, our banner ministries. Thank you, God, for each of these individuals. Lord, you have uniquely knit Ian and Mike and Omari and Alberto and Isai for your glory. God, I saw that on this trip. And Lord, you did miraculous and incredible things, things that can only be counted to the goodness and the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So God, we do give you all the glory and we thank you, Lord, for the continued partnership. God, we bless them, but we also bless every pastor, every leader, every youth, every child that's in the Philippines, Lord God, that's part of our ministry. God, we thank you for the 300 mile stretch that you have given us from Legaspi to Makati, Lord God. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that we would plant 100 plus churches for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. We pray for many salvations, many baptisms, much work to be done, Lord God. We do, we pray against the militant uh, Islam that is rising up in that country, Christians getting killed and kidnapped, Lord.
God, we pray in the name of Jesus, safety and expansion for the true gospel to be heard and to be seen and for Lord, you to know Lord God and many people to know you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing there. God, we pray for your glory from our own backyard to the very ends of the earth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise tonight. Well, we want to remind you as you go, uh, number one, uh, pick up your kids. Uh, they're yours, not ours. And I think we've had enough of caring for children over those couple of weeks that we were there. We love you, church. But we do want to ask you as well, if you would have it in your heart to support this missions work, the shirts that we're wearing tonight, uh, these shirts have been printed by a member in our church. It's been an opportunity for him to give back to the church. And every shirt that's sold, all of that money, every dollar, goes back to the work that we're doing with Jesus, our banner ministries. We're gonna be sending a one to two groups every year. I'm already going back in February of next year to raise and develop pastors and plant new churches. If you would just consider buying a shirt and wearing that shirt, that money would go to literally helping to feed, save, restore lives in the Philippines and you could be a part of the missions work that God did this summer, amen? Well, we love you, church. Enjoy the hospitality. If you're a guest, check out our guest table. We'd love to get to know you better. Be uh, the church. Take time to get to know one another. We love you. We bless.